it's a genuine pleasure to welcome all of you to the Elliott School and the campus of the George Washington University this evening. Uh, this event is truly a very special event, uh, an event recognizing one of the landmarks in the field of international security studies and recognizing two of the true giants in the field of strategic studies, Tom Schelling and Mort Halperin. Uh, first, though, I would like to say something about this series of events uh, that's sponsoring tonight's, um, tonight's session. The Security Policy Forum was created in 2007. It's been directed by our GW colleague, Jim Leibovic, for these past four years. Uh, over these past four years, Jim has organized 22 events, bringing more than 50 of the world's leading thinkers on a wide range of security and security policy issues here to GW. And under Jim's leadership, this series has really become a signature series here at GW and something that I think has very much enlivened the intellectual debate here on this campus, but also in Washington, D.C. more generally. And I'm very grateful to Jim for his leadership and now bringing this series into its fifth year. Uh, I want to say just a couple of words uh, about the event this evening. Uh, and it's a great day for any dean when you actually get to carry books around. Of course, we're here to recognize and talk about Strategy and Arms Control, one of the great books in international security studies. Uh, but the two authors of that book, Tom Schelling and Mort Halperin, have contributed tremendously to the intellectual development of the field over the years. Uh, just two of their books in particular, I want to point out as landmarks in their own right, the Strategy of Conflict by Tom Schelling and Bureaucratic Politics and Foreign Policy by Mort Halperin. And these two books, I think, really reflect you know, the range of their contributions to our thinking about strategic and international issues because they look at strategy and policy, looking at strategy as it should be, but also policy as it actually is. And of course, those two things are not as close as we would like, but they've helped us to understand where we ought to go and where we actually are. And I'd like to say just at a personal level, uh, these two books and these two gentlemen have played a, a huge role in my own life. Uh, I read The Strategy of Conflict uh, in 1973, and it was the book that inspired me to give up a major in mathematics and to study something more directly relevant. And when I mentioned this to Professor Schelling about 10 or 15 years ago, he made a point of saying that he wasn't taking any responsibility for that. <laughs> but I do want to acknowledge how tremendously important this book and your work has been in my own thinking, in my own life. And then when I went to work on my doctoral dissertation on the U.S. Strategic Bomber Program, I was trying to figure out what was going on. Well, bureaucratic politics and foreign policy just is a wealth of intellectual insights. And that book helped to shape my dissertation, which became a book of its own. And it's no exaggeration to say that these books have supported and echoed throughout the generations uh, in the field of security studies. And, and as a dean, these books are also very helpful because you really need to understand the strategy of conflict and you really need to understand <laughs> bureaucratic <laughs> politics to survive as a dean. And from time to time, I've employed arms and influence as well. I'm Tom Schelling. I thought I'd tell you a little bit about how this book came to be written and why I think it was influential uh, back in the early parts of 1960, the 20th Century Fund agreed with several people at MIT that it would be worthwhile to have a what they called a summer study, a two-month period when maybe 18 or 20 people from Harvard and MIT and environs could spend that much time discussing arms control. And I had already been to Yale where I met Mort Halperin, who had just finished his, cor his coursework for a PhD. And I was so impressed with him that I had invited him to come to Harvard to the Center for International Affairs to do his dissertation. And when I agreed to join this summer study, I had a good idea. I thought Mart Halperin might come up and uh, I could get him to be recognized as a rapporteur and he could take notes all summer long and the notes might turn out to be worth something. Uh, anyway, <laughs> he did that. This was a group, if you've ever looked at the back of the book, I, th I think there's about 55 people are listed as having participated somehow in that summer study. I think about 18 or 20 of us were regulars and 30 or more 
or visitors. Um, well, when the summer was over, Morton and I decided that the group had arrived at enough of a consensus that somebody ought to write it down, and obviously we were the person, the people to do so, partly because that's what Mort was there for, to help somebody do. Now, recognize that Mort was simply a 25-year-old graduate student. <laughs> Here I was, a, an old man, but uh, <laughs> we, sometime soon after the book was published, somebody, I think it was David Singer of the University of Michigan, assumed that the book was primarily mine. He thought that must have been because I was, I was the mature member of the team. I had to write to him and tell him absolutely false that I couldn't even remember which parts of the book I had written because Mort and I took turns writing chapters and then reading each other's chapters and critiquing them and rewriting them. And in the end, I think somebody mentioned uh, about when Mort and I agreed. <laughs> I think George said it. When Mort and I agree, he agrees. I think Mort and I agreed on everything that went into the book. And uh, then what was most interesting, just about that same time, some foundation, I forget which, offered the Harvard Center for International Affairs and the MIT Center for International Studies $50,000 to do something together. Well, Link Bloomfield was nominated for the MIT group, and I was nominated for the Harvard group, and we, we agreed that what we should do is establish an arms control seminar that would meet every three weeks to have dinner at a faculty club, alternating faculty clubs between Harvard and MIT, and that we would at least do, do that all through the fall term, and if we liked it, we'd keep it up. So what Mort and I did, every three weeks during the fall term, we provided a chapter for the group to discuss. So we, we had a very intelligent, highly motivated group meeting at either MIT or Harvard for dinner and discussion. And as a result, uh, we, more than if they had read it, we were able to get this group of people thinking about arms control. One of them was Jerome Wiesner, who became the White House science advisor. One of them was McGeorge Bundy, who became the White House national security advisor. One was Abe Shays, who became general counsel of the State Department. One was Harry Rowan, who had come from Rand to spend a year with me. And uh, uh, he became deputy assistant secretary for international security affairs in the Pentagon under Paul Nitze. I almost went, Paul Nitze asked me to be his deputy for arms control, and I said, I'm not ready to leave Harvard yet, but I promoted John McNaughton, whom he appointed, and who ultimately succeeded him. And so many key people in the Kennedy administration had just been through a seminar on a book that Mort and I were preparing, and the book, the 20th Century Fund, put up enough money to get the book published so rapidly that I think before the end of January, we had enough copies to distribute. I don't know how many copies. Do you know how many copies we distributed? But we, we had all the copies we, we could want to distribute. And as a result, I think, because of the coincidence of this arms control seminar with so many people who simply moved into the Kennedy White House, uh, it, it was very influential. And uh, uh, people like Robert McNamara, who was the first Secretary of Defense under Kennedy. Uh, he liked the book, and all kinds of people in the government read the book because they knew that Jerry Wiesner and uh, Mac Bundy and such people were interested, so they got the book and they read it. And uh, I don't think we've ever had, I've never had uh, such a captive audience <laughs> for something I've read. So I thought you'd be interested to hear that. and. Uh, one last point. I have never again collaborated with anybody in writing anything. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty sure the reason is that Mort and I worked so well together, I couldn't believe that it could ever happen again. <laughs> Thank you. 
Actually, it's been happening to everybody here. Tom stole my line. I was going to point out that I, after that experience, wrote things with maybe 25 other people, and Tom never again. <laughs> but I drew a different conclusion from that than he did. That uh, He concluded I was not somebody uh, that he didn't want to work with other people, while well, I concluded that I did. I've never again found a collaborator like Tom. But uh, I have a slightly different uh, memory of how this uh, book came about, although it's not incompatible. Uh, I arrived, as Tom said, at the Harvard-MIT Arms Control Seminar, fresh from uh, four years as an undergraduate with George Quester at Columbia, in which Glenn Snyder had taught us uh, deterrence theory. Um, and then at Yale, where nobody told me that everybody who cared about deterrence theory had moved to Princeton. <laughs> and so I got there and was, uh, Bill Kaufman, it turned out, was hiding in a library somewhere, and I finally found him. <laughs> and so I had somebody uh, to talk to. I went eagerly to a lecture by Tom Schelling, in which he explained that he had moved uh, from Yale to Harvard because he figured out he could raise the average in both places by making the move. And <laughs> <laughs> the Yale economists all like that. Um, but I arrived there having been taught what everybody was taught in political science courses, namely that disarmament, as it was called, was simply a propaganda exercise, that we had learned from history that efforts to reduce weapons between potential adversaries only increased the risk of war, only encouraged the aggressive tendencies of states which could not be appeased, uh, and that it lulled the public into thinking war was not possible and therefore to reduce weapons, and that therefore disarmament was a public relations exercise. And there was a famous book by two political scientists which said that there was always a joker in every proposal. Uh, every side presented a proposal which would look good to world public opinion uh, and which was, in fact, not serious and everybody understood it would never, in fact, be implemented. And this group of people all had a very different view. And the view was, as has been explained, that, in fact, one should think about cooperative measures, uh, whether they were negotiated or by mutual example or by informal negotiation, as having exactly the same purposes as defense policy did. That is to reduce the risk of war, to reduce the damage if war occurred, and to reduce the cost of the arms race. And that this was a fundamentally different way of thinking about what government should do when dealing with the question of negotiated agreements with potential adversaries. The test ban had become an exception, but the test ban, I think, was driven mostly by uh, the fear of the consequences of above ground tests and the health consequences of that. And so the question was, if you could, in fact, verify an agreement, then it was OK to have one, not because anybody had a theory of how the test ban would reduce the risk of, of war that nobody wanted and increase our security, but rather you could accept it and you had to accept it for political purposes. In fact, Don Brennan and I, at around the same time, tried to make the contrary argument that the test ban really was in the strategic interest of the United States in an article that we wrote uh, in the book that Brennan edited, which was uh, also came out of the summer study on arms control. Um, but it was, I had the interesting experience several years later to have a chance to put this into practice in the Johnson administration. I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense uh, for Arms Control and Policy Planning. And we had finally come around to an acceptance of this notion inside the government. And it had really been driven by Bob McNamara, who we like to think learned all of it from the book but who uh, made a deal with, uh, with Lyndon Johnson that he would accept the deployment of an ABM system, which we thought was fundamentally incompatible with our security interests, because Johnson said he needed it for political purposes, if in return we would start for the first time serious efforts to negotiate with the Russians 
about arms control as we had described it in the book. That is arms control, which we intended to reach an agreement, which we intended the agreement to be one that both sides would see as reducing the risk of a war that neither wanted or the consequences of a war uh, if it occurred. And uh, there were a number of signs that everybody knew that this was different. If you recall, at the time, these negotiations were carried on at the, by the, with the Russians in Geneva in public sessions. And we would present proposals, the Russians would present proposals, and then we would compete for international public opinion as to which one of us had a better proposal, each of us knowing that there was no chance that either of us would accept uh, the proposal. I don't know what we would have done uh, if the Russians had said, OK, uh, we'll accept your proposal. Nobody expected that to happen. Everybody was confident it would not happen. For example, our proposals always required that the Russians accept inferiority and total and complete uh, verification that we would have the right to send anybody anywhere in the Soviet Union to look at anything we wanted to do. And everybody understood uh, that the Russians would not accept that. But there was a consensus in the government uh, that this was serious and that we were attempting to put forward a proposal. The direction from the White House was that the President wanted a proposal which had the support of the Joint Chiefs in which our ambassador to Moscow, Llewellyn Thompson, would say there was a serious chance that the Russians would take seriously, and that if adopted, we believed, it would increase the security of both countries. Uh, and that was a revolution. I think we never were able to sustain it, as, as John and others have pointed out. Later, arms control agreements lost track of what the purpose was and what it was going to do. But the process that started in 68 really did follow the direction and guidance of the book. Uh, and we came up with a proposal um, that the Joint Chiefs of Staff for the first time said, this proposal is acceptable even though we cannot verify it 100%. And they said uh, that this proposal will enhance the security of the United States if effectively <coughs> negotiated and accepted by the Russians. That was the first time they had said anything but we can live with this if you really have to do it. It really was an acceptance of this notion that an agreement could enhance our security. And then, of course, the Russians invaded Czechoslovakia uh, and everything uh, went downhill uh, from there, although it got picked up to some extent uh, in the Nixon administration. But uh, for me, the, the power of the book was not only that it had an important intellectual idea, but it had a very specific set of recommendations about how policymakers should think about uh, negotiated and informal agreements with potential adversaries. And I think that approach uh, more or less has stuck since then.